Section 11 of A Preface to Politics by Walter Lippmann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Revolution and Culture. There is a legend of a peasant who lived near Paris through the whole Napoleonic era without ever having heard of the name of Bonaparte. A story of that kind is enough to make a man hesitate before he indulges in a flamboyant description of social changes. That peasant is more than a symbol of the privacy of human interest. He is a warning against the incurable romanticism which clings about the idea of a revolution. Popular history is deceptive if it is used to furnish a picture for coming events. Like drama which compresses the tragedy of a lifetime into a unity of time, place, and action, history foreshortens an epoch into an episode. It gains in poignancy but loses reality. Men grew from infancy to old age. Their children's children had married and loved and worked, while the social change we speak of as the Industrial Revolution was being consummated. That is why it is so difficult for living people to believe that they too are in the midst of great transformations. What looks to us like an incredible rush of events sloping towards a great historical crisis was, to our ancestors, little else than the occasional punctuation of daily life with an exciting incident. Even today, when we have begun to speak of our age as a transition, there are millions of people who live in an undisturbed routine. Even those of us who regard ourselves as active in mothering the process and alert in detecting its growth are by no means constantly aware of any great change, for even the fondest mother cannot watch her child grow. I remember how tremendously surprised I was in visiting Russia several years ago to find that in Moscow or St. Petersburg men were interested in all sorts of things besides the revolution. I had expected every Russian to be absorbed in the struggle, it seemed, at first, as if my notions of what a revolution ought to be were contradicted everywhere, and I assure you it wrenched the imagination to see tiny nursemaids wheeling perambulators and children playing Diavolo on the very square where Bloody Sunday had gone into history. It takes a long perspective and no very vivid acquaintance with revolution to be melodramatic about it. So much is left out of history and biography which would spoil the effect. The anticlimax is almost always omitted. Perhaps that is the reason why Arnold Bennett's description of the siege of Paris in The Old Wives' Tale is so disconcerting to many people. It is hard to believe that daily life continues with its stretches of boredom and its personal interests even while the enemy is bombarding a city. How much more difficult is it to imagine a revolution that is to come, to space it properly through a long period of time, to conceive what it will be like to the people who live through it. Almost all social prediction is catastrophic and absurdly simplified. Even those who talk of the slow evolution of society are likely to think of it as a series of definite changes, easily marked and well known to everybody. It is what Bernard Shaw calls the reformer's habit of mistaking his private emotions for a public movement. Even though the next century is full of dramatic episodes, the collapse of governments and labor wars, these events will be to the social revolution what the smashing of machines in Lancashire was to the Industrial Revolution. The reality that is worthy of attention is a change in the very texture and quality of millions of lives, a change that will be vividly perceptible only in the retrospect of history. The conservative often has a sharp sense of the complexity of revolution. Not desiring change, he prefers to emphasize its difficulties 
whereas the reformer is enticed into a faith that the intensity of desire is a measure of its social effect. Yet just because no reform is in itself a revolution, we must not jump to the assurance that no revolution can be accomplished. True as it is that great changes are imperceptible, it is no less true that they are constantly taking place. Moreover, for the very reason that human life changes its quality so slowly, the panic over political proposals is childish. It is obvious, for instance, that the recall of judges will not revolutionize the national life. That is why the opposition generated will seem superstitious to the next generation. As I write, a convention of the populist party has just taken place. Eight delegates attended the meeting, which was held in a parlor. Even the reactionary press speaks in a kindly way about these men. Twenty years ago the populists were hated and feared as if they practiced black magic. What they wanted is on the point of realization. To some of us it looks like a drop in the bucket, a slight part of vastly greater plans. But how stupid was the fear of populism! What unimaginative nonsense it was to suppose twenty years ago that the program was the road to the end of the world! One good deed or one bad one is no measure of a man's character. The last judgment, let us hope, will be no series of decisions as simple as that. The soul survives its adventures, says Chesterton with a splendid sense of justice. A country survives its legislation. That truth should not comfort the conservative nor depress the radical for it means that public policy can enlarge its scope and increase its audacity, can try big experiments without trembling too much over the result. This nation could enter upon the most radical experiments and could afford to fail in them. Mistakes do not affect us so deeply as we imagine. Our prophecies of change are subjective wishes or fears that never come to full realization. Those socialists are confused who think that a new era can begin by a general strike or an electoral victory. Their critics are just a bit more confused when they become hysterical over the prospect. Both of them overemphasize the importance of single events. Yet I do not wish to furnish the impression that crises are negligible. They are extremely important as symptoms, as milestones, and as instruments. It is simply that the reality of a revolution is not in a political decree or the scarehead of a newspaper, but in the experiences, feelings, habits of myriads of men. No one who watched the textile strike at Lawrence, Massachusetts in the winter of 1912 can forget the astounding effect it had on the complacency of the public very little was revealed that any well-informed social worker does not know as a commonplace about the mill population. The wretchedness and brutality of Lawrence conditions had been described in books and magazines and speeches, until radicals had begun to wonder at times whether the power of language wasn't exhausted. The response was discouragingly weak, an occasional government investigation, an impassioned protest from a few individuals, a placid charity, were about all that the middle-class public had to say about factory life. The cynical indifference of legislatures and the hypocrisy of the dominant parties were all that politics had to offer. The Lawrence strike touched the most impervious. Story after story came to our ears of hardened reporters who suddenly refused to misrepresent the strikers of politicians aroused to action, of social workers become revolutionary. Daily conversation was shocked into some contact with realities. The newspapers actually printed facts about the situation of a working-class population. And why? The reason is not far to seek. The Lawrence strikers did something more than insist upon their wrongs. 
they showed a disposition to write them. That is what scared public opinion into some kind of truth-telling. So long as the poor are docile in their poverty, the rest of us are only too willing to satisfy our consciences by pitying them. But when the downtrodden gather into a threat, as they did at Lawrence, when they show that they have no stake in civilization, and consequently no respect for its institutions, when the object of pity becomes the avenger of its own miseries, then the middle-class public begins to look at the problem more intelligently. We are not civilized enough to meet an issue before it becomes acute. We were not intelligent enough to free the slaves peacefully. We are not intelligent enough today to meet the industrial problem before it develops a crisis. That is the hard truth of the matter, and that is why no honest student of politics can plead that social movements should confine themselves to argument and debate, abandoning the militancy of the strike, the insurrection, the strategy of social conflict. Those who deplore the use of force in the labor struggle should ask themselves whether the ruling classes of a country could be depended upon to inaugurate a program of reconstruction which would abolish the barbarism that prevails in industry. Does anyone seriously believe that the business leaders, the makers of opinion, and the politicians will, on their own initiative, bring social questions to a solution? If they do, it will be for the first time in history. The trivial plans they are introducing today profit-sharing and welfare work, are on their own admission an attempt to quiet the unrest and ward off the menace of socialism. No, paternalism is not dependable, granting that it is desirable. It will do very little more than it feels compelled to do. Those who today bear the brunt of our evils dare not throw themselves upon the mercy of their masters, not though there are bread and circuses as a reward. From the groups upon whom the pressure is most direct must come the power to deal with it. We are not all immediately interested in all problems. Our attention wanders unless the people who are interested compel us to listen. Social movements are at once the symptoms and the instruments of progress. Ignore them and statesmanship is irrelevant fail to use them, and it is weak. Often in the course of these essays I have quoted from H. G. Wells. I must do so again. Quote, Every party stands essentially for the interests and mental usages of some definite class or group of classes in the exciting community, and every party has its scientific-minded and constructive leading section with well-defined hinterlands formulating its social functions in a public-spirited form, and its superficial-minded following confessing its meanness and vanities and prejudices. No class will abolish itself, materially alter its way of living, or drastically reconstruct itself, albeit no class is indisposed to cooperate in the unlimited socialization of any other class. In that capacity for aggression upon other classes lies the essential driving force of modern affairs. Unquote. The truth of this can be tested in the socialist movement. There is a section among the socialists which regards the class movement of labor as a driving force in the socialization of industry. This group sees clearly that without the threat of aggression no settlement of the issues is possible. Ordinarily, such socialists say that the class struggle is a movement which will end classes. They mean that the self-interest of labor is identical with the interests of a community, that it is a kind of social selfishness. But there are other socialists who speak constantly of working-class government, and they mean just what they say. It is their intention to have the community ruled in the interests of labor, probe their minds to find out what they mean by labor, and in all honesty you cannot escape the admission 
that they mean industrial labor alone. These socialists think entirely in terms of the factory population of cities. The farmers, the small shopkeepers, the professional classes have only a perfunctory interest for them. I know that no end of phrases could be adduced to show the inclusiveness of the word labor, but their intention is what I have tried to describe. They are thinking of government by a factory population. They appeal to history for confirmation. Have not all social changes, they ask, meant the emergence of a new economic class until it dominated society? Did not the French Revolution mean the conquest of the feudal landlord by the middle-class merchant? Why should not the social revolution mean the victory of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie? That may be true, but it is no reason for being bullied by it into a tame admission that what has always been must always be. I see no reason for exalting the unconscious failures of other revolutions into deliberate models for the next one. Just because the capacity of aggression in the middle class ran away with things, and failed to fuse into any decent social ideal, is not ground for trying as earnestly as possible to repeat the mistake. The lesson of it all, it seems to me, is this, that class interests are the driving forces which keep public life centered upon essentials. They become dangerous to a nation when it denies them, thwarts them, and represses them so long that they burst out and become dominant. Then there is no limit to their aggression until another class appears with contrary interests. The situation might be compared to those hysterias in which a suppressed impulse flares up and rules the whole mental life. Social life has nothing whatever to fear from group interests so long as it doesn't try to play the ostrich in regard to them. So the burden of national crises is squarely upon the dominant classes who fight so foolishly against the emergent ones. That is what precipitates violence. That is what renders social cooperation impossible. That is what makes catastrophes the method of change. The wisest rulers see this. They know that the responsibility for insurrections rests, in the last analysis, upon the unimaginative greed and endless stupidity of the dominant classes. There is something pathetic in the blindness of powerful people when they face a social crisis. Fighting viciously every readjustment which a nation demands, they make their own overthrow inevitable. It is they who turn opposing interests into a class war. Confronted with the deep insurgency of labor, what do capitalists and their spokesmen do? They resist every demand, submit only after a struggle, and prepare a condition of war to the death. When far-sighted men appear in the ruling classes, men who recognize the need of a civilized answer to this increasing restlessness, the rich and the powerful treat them to a scorn and a hatred that are incredibly bitter. The hostility against men like Roosevelt, La Follette, Bryan, Lloyd George, is enough to make an observer believe that the rich of today are as stupid as the nobles of France before the Revolution. It seems to me that Roosevelt never spoke more wisely or as a better friend of civilization than the time when he said at New York City on March 20, 1912, that, quote, the woes of France for a century and a quarter have been due to the folly of her people in splitting into the two camps of unreasonable conservatism and unreasonable radicalism. Had pre-revolutionary France listened to men like Turgot and backed them up, all would have gone well. But the beneficiaries of privilege, the Bourbon reactionaries, the short-sighted ultra-conservatives, turned down Turgot, and then found that instead of him they had obtained Robespierre. They gained twenty years' freedom from all restraint and reform, 
at the cost of the whirlwind of the Red Terror, and in their turn the unbridled extremists of the Terror induced a blind reaction, and so, with convulsion and oscillation from one extreme to another, with alterations of violent radicalism and violent Bourbonism, the French people went through misery to a shattered goal." Unquote. Profound changes are not only necessary but highly desirable. Even if this country were comfortably well off, healthy, prosperous, and educated, men would go on inventing and creating opportunities to amplify the possibilities of life. These inventions would mean radical transformations, for we are bent upon establishing more in this nation than a minimum of comfort. A liberal people would welcome social inventions as gladly as we do mechanical ones. What it would fear is a hard-shell resistance to change which brings it about explosively. Catastrophes are disastrous to radical and conservative alike. They do not preserve what was worth maintaining. They allow a deformed and often monstrous perversion of the original plan. The emancipation of the slaves might teach us the lesson that an explosion followed by reconstruction is satisfactory to nobody. Statesmanship would go out to meet a crisis before it had become acute. The thing it would emphatically not do is to dam up an insurgent current until it overflowed the countryside. Fight labor's demands to the last ditch, and there will come a time when it seizes the whole of power makes itself sovereign, and takes what it used to ask. That is a poor way for a nation to proceed. For the insurgent become master is a fanatic from the struggle, and, as George Santayana says, he is only too likely to redouble his effort after he has forgotten his aim. Nobody need waste his time debating whether or not there are to be great changes. That is settled for us, whether we like it or not. What is worth debating is the method by which change is to come about. Our choice, it seems to me, lies between a blind push and a deliberate leadership, between thwarting movements until they master us, and domesticating them until they are answered. When Roosevelt formed the Progressive Party on a platform of social reform, he crystallized a deep unrest, brought it out of the cellars of resentment into the agora of political discussion. He performed the real task of a leader, a task which has essentially two dimensions. By becoming part of the dynamics of unrest, he gathered a power of effectiveness. By formulating a program for insurgency, he translated it into terms of public service. What Roosevelt did at the middle-class level, the socialists have done at the proletarian. The world has been slow to recognize the work of the socialist party in transmuting a dumb muttering into a civilized program. It has found an intelligent outlet for forces that would otherwise be purely cataclysmic. The truth of this has been tested recently in the appearance of the direct actionists. They are men who have lost faith in political socialism. Why? Because, like all other groups, the socialists tend to become routineers, to slip into an easy reiteration. The direct actionists are a warning to the socialist party that its tactics and its program are not adequate to domesticating the deepest unrest of labor. Within that party, therefore, a leadership is required which will ride the forces of syndicalism and use them for a constructive purpose. The brilliant writer of The Notes of the Week in the English New Age has shown how this might be done. He has fused the insight of the syndicalist with the plans of the collectivists under the name of Guild Socialism. His plan calls for co-management of industry by the state and the labor union. It steers a course between exploitation by a bureaucracy in the interests of the consumer, the socialist danger, 
and oppressive monopolies by industrial unions, the syndicalist danger. I shall not attempt to argue here either for or against the scheme. My concern is with method rather than with special pleadings. The guild socialism of the new age is merely an instance of statesmanlike dealing with a new social force. Instead of throwing up its hands in horror at one over-advertised tactical incident like sabotage, the New Age went straight to the creative impulse of the syndicalist movement. Every true craftsman, artist, or professional man knows and sympathizes with that impulse. You may call it a desire for self-direction in labor. The deepest revolt implied in the term syndicalism is against the impersonal, driven quality of modern industry, against the destruction of that pride which alone distinguishes work from slavery. Some such impulse as that is what marks off syndicalism from the other revolts of labor. Our suspicion of the collectivist arrangement is aroused by the picture of a vast state machine so horribly well regulated that human impulse is utterly subordinated. I believe, too, that the fighting qualities of syndicalism are kept at the boiling point by a greater sense of outraged human dignity than can be found among mere socialists or unionists. The imagination is more vivid. The horror of capitalism is not alone in the poverty and suffering it entails, but in its ruthless denial of life to millions of men. The most cruel of all denials is to deprive a human being of joyous activity. Syndicalism is shot through with the assertion that an imposed drudgery is intolerable, that labor at a subsistence wage, as a cog in a meaningless machine, is no condition upon which to found civilization. That is a new kind of revolt, more dangerous to capitalism than the demand for higher wages. You cannot treat the syndicalists like cattle, because forsooth they have ceased to be cattle. The damned wantlessness of the poor, about which Oscar Wilde complained, the cry for a little more fodder, gives way to an insistence upon the chance to be interested in life. To shut the door in the face of such a current of feeling because it is occasionally exasperated into violence would be as futile as locking up children because they get into mischief. The mind which rejects syndicalism entirely because of the by-products of its despair has had pearls cast before it in vain. I know that syndicalism means a revision of some of our plans, that it is an intrusion upon many a glib prejudice but a human impulse is more important than any existing theory. We must not throw an unexpected guest out of the window because no place is set for him at table. For we lose not only the charm of his company, he may in anger wreck the house. Yet the whole nation can't sit at one table. The politician will object that all human interests can't be embodied in a party program. That is true, truer than most politicians would admit in public. No party can represent a whole nation, although, with the exception of the socialists, all of them pretend to do just that. The reason is very simple. A platform is a list of performances that are possible within a few years. It is concerned with more or less immediate proposals, and in a nation split up by class, sectional and racial interests, these proposals are sure to arouse hostility. No definite industrial and political platform, for example, can satisfy rich and poor, black and white, eastern creditor and western farmer. A party that tried to answer every conflicting interest would stand still, because people were pulling in so many different directions. It would arouse the anger of every group and the approval of its framers. It would have no dynamic power, because the forces would neutralize each other. 
One comprehensive party platform fusing every interest is impossible and undesirable. What is both possible and desirable is that every group interest should be represented in public life, that it should have spokesmen and influence in public affairs. This is almost impossible today. Our blundering political system is pachydermic in its irresponsiveness. The methods of securing representation are unfit instruments for any flexible use. But the United States is evidently not exceptional in this respect. England seems to suffer in the same way. In May 1912, the Daily Mail published a series of articles by H. G. Wells on the labor unrest. Is he not describing almost any session of Congress, when he says that, quote, to go into the House of Commons is to go aside out of the general stream of the community's vitality into a corner where little is learnt and much is concocted, into a specialized assembly which is at once inattentive to and monstrously influential in our affairs." Unquote. Further on, Wells remarks that, quote, "...the diminishing actuality of our political life is a matter of almost universal comment today. In Great Britain we do not have elections any more. We have rejections." What really happens at a general election is that the party organizations, obscure and secretive conclaves with entirely mysterious funds, appoint about twelve hundred men to be our rulers, and all that we, we so-called self-governing people, are permitted to do is, in a muddled, angry way, to strike off the names of about half these selected gentlemen." Unquote. A cynic might say that the people can't go far wrong in politics because they can't be very right. Our so-called representative system is unrepresentative in a deeper way than the reformers who talk about the money power imagine. It is empty and thin, a stifling of living currents in the interest of a mediocre regularity. But suppose that politics were made responsive. Suppose that the forces of the community found avenues of expression into public life. Would not our legislatures be cut up into antagonistic parties? Would not the conflicts of the nation be concentrated into one heated hall? If you really represented the country in its government, would you not get its partisanship in a quintessential form? After all, group interests in the nation are diluted by space and time. The mere separation in cities and country prevents them from falling into the psychology of the crowd. But let them all be represented in one room by men who are professionally interested in their constituency's prejudices, and what would you accomplish but a deepening of the cleavages? Would the session not become an interminable wrangle? Nobody can answer these questions with any certainty. Most prophecies are simply the masquerades of prejudice, and the people who love stability and prefer to let their own well-being alone will see in a sensitive political system little but an invitation to chaos. They will choose facts to adorn their fears. History can be all things to all men. Nothing is easier than to summon the terror, the commune, lynchings in the southern states, as witnesses to the excesses and hysterias of the mob. Those facts will prove the case conclusively to anyone who has already made up his mind on the subject. Absolute Democrats can also line up their witnesses, the conservatism of the Swiss, Wisconsin's successful experiments, the patience and judgment of the Danes. Both sides are remarkably sure that the right is with them whereas the only truth about which an observer can be entirely certain is that in some places and in certain instances democracy is admittedly successful. There is no absolute case one way or the other. It would be silly from the experience we have to make a simple judgment about the value of direct expression. You cannot lump such a mass of events together 
and come to a single conclusion about them. It is a crude habit of mind that would attempt it. You might as well talk abstractly about the goodness or badness of this universe, which contains happiness, pain, exhilaration, and indifference in a thousand varying grades and quantities. There is no such thing as democracy. There are a number of more or less democratic experiments, which are not subject to wholesale eulogy or condemnation. The questions about the success of a truly representative system are pseudo-questions, and for this reason, success is not due to the system, it does not flow from it automatically. The source of success is in the people who use the system. As an instrument it may help or hinder them, but they must operate it. Government is not a machine running on straight tracks to a desired goal. It is a human work which may be facilitated by good tools. That is why the achievements of the Swiss may mean nothing whatever when you come to prophesy about the people of New York. Because Wisconsin has made good use of the direct primary, it does not follow that it will benefit the Filipino. It always seems curious to watch the satisfaction of some reform magazines when China or Turkey or Persia imitates the constitutional forms of Western democracies. Such enthusiasts postulate a uniformity of human ability which every fact of life contradicts. Present-day reform lays a great emphasis upon instruments and very little upon the skillful use of them. It says that human nature is all right, that what is wrong is the system. Now the effect of this has been to concentrate attention on institutions and to slight men. A small step further, institutions become an end in themselves. They may violate human nature as the taboo does. That does not disturb the interest in them very much, for by common consent reformers are to fix their minds upon the system. A machine should be run by men for human uses, the preoccupation with the system lays altogether too little stress on the men who operate it and the men for whom it is run. It is as if you put all your effort into the working of a plow and forgot the farmer and the consumer. I state the case baldly and contradiction would be easy. The reformer might point to phrases like human welfare which appear in his writings. And yet the point stands, I believe. The emphasis which directs his thinking bears most heavily upon the mechanics of life, only perfunctorily upon the ability of the men who are to use them. Even an able reformer like Mr. Frederick C. Howe does not escape entirely. A recent book is devoted to a glowing eulogy of Wisconsin, an experiment in democracy. In a concluding chapter, Mr. Howe states the philosophy of the experiment. Quote, what is the explanation of Wisconsin, he asks? Why has it been able to eliminate corruption, machine politics, and rid itself of the boss? What is the cause of the efficiency, the thoroughness, the desire to serve which animate the state? Why has Wisconsin succeeded where other states have uniformly failed? I think the explanation is simple. It is also perfectly natural. It is traceable to democracy, to the political freedom which had its beginning in the direct primary law, and which has been continuously strengthened by later laws. Some pages later, Wisconsin assumed that the trouble with our politics is not with our people, but with the machinery with which the people work. It has established a line of vision as direct as possible between the people and the expression of their will. Unquote. The impression Mr. Howe evidently wishes to leave with his readers is that the success of the experiment is due to the instruments rather than to the talent of the people of Wisconsin. That would be a valuable and comforting assurance to propagandists, for it means that other states with the same instruments can achieve the same success. 
but the conclusion seems to me utterly unfounded. The reasoning is parallel like that of the gifted lady amateur, who expects to achieve greatness by imitating the paint-box and palette, oils and canvases of an artist. Mr. Howe's own book undermines his conclusions. He begins with an account of La Follette, of a man with initiative and a constructive bent. The forces of La Follette set in motion are commented upon. The work of Van Hise is shown. What Wisconsin had was leadership and a people that responded, inventors and constructive minds. They forged the direct primary and the state university out of the impetus within themselves. No doubt they were fortunate in their choice of instruments. They made the expression of the people's will direct, yet that will surely is the more primary thing. It makes and uses representative systems, but you cannot reverse the process. A man can manufacture a plow and operate it, but no amount of plows will create a man and endow him with skill. All sorts of observers have pointed out that the western states adopt reform legislation more quickly than the eastern. Yet no one would seriously maintain that the west is more progressive because it has progressive laws. The laws are a symptom and an aid, but certainly not the cause. Constitutions do not make people. People make constitutions. So the task of reform consists not in presenting a state with progressive laws, but in getting the people to want them. The practical difference is extraordinary. I insist upon it so much because the tendency of political discussion is to regard government as automatic, a device that is sure to fail or sure to succeed. It is sure of nothing. Effort moves it. Intelligence directs it. Its fate is in human hands. End of section 11 Section 12 of A Preface to Politics by Walter Lippmann this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Continuation of Chapter 9 The politics I have urged in these chapters cannot be learned by rote. What can be taught by rule of thumb is the administration of precedence. That is at once the easiest and the most fruitless form of public activity. Only a low degree of intelligence is required, and of effort merely a persistent repetition. Men fall into a routine when they are tired and slack. It has all the appearance of activity, with few of its burdens. It was a profound observation when Bernard Shaw said that men dread liberty because of the bewildering responsibility it imposes and the uncommon alertness it demands. To do what has always been done, to think in well-cut channels, to give up the intolerable disease of thought, is an almost constant demand of our natures. That is perhaps why so many of the romantic rebels of the nineteenth century sank at last into the comforting arms of Mother Church. That is perhaps the reason why most oldish men acquire information but learn very little. The conservative who loves his routine is, in nine cases out of ten, a creature too lazy to change its habits. Confronted with a novelty, the first impulse is to snub it and send it into exile. When it becomes too persistent to be ignored, a taboo is erected and threats of fines and condign punishment are made if it doesn't cease to appear. This is the level of culture at which Sherman Antitrust Acts are passed, brothels are raided, and labor agitators are thrown into jail. If the taboo is effective, it drives the evil under cover, 
where it festers and emits a slow poison. This is the price we pay for the appearance of suppression. But if the problem is more heavily charged with power, the taboo irritates the force until it explodes. Not infrequently what was once simply a factor of life becomes the dominating part of it. At this point, the whole routineer scheme of things collapses. There is a period of convulsion and caesarean births, and men weary of excitement sink back into a newer routine. Thus the cycle of futility is completed. The process bears as much resemblance to statecraft as sitting backward on a runaway horse does to horsemanship. The ordinary politician has no real control, no direction, no insight into the power he rides. What he has is an elevated, though temporary, seat. Real statesmanship has a different ambition. It begins by accepting human nature. No routine has ever done that in spite of the conservative patter about human nature. Mechanical politics has usually begun by ignoring and ended by violating the nature of men. To accept that nature does not mean that we accept its present character. It is probably true that the impulses of men have changed very little within recorded history. What has changed enormously from epoch to epoch is the character in which these impulses appear. The impulses that at one period work themselves out into cruelty and lust may at another produce the richest values of civilized life. The statesman can affect that choice. His business is to provide fine opportunities for the expression of human impulses, to surround childhood youth and age, with homes and schools, cities and countryside that shall be stocked with interest and the chance for generous activity. Government can play a leading part in this work, for with the decadence of the Church it has become the only truly Catholic organization in the land. Its task is essentially to carry out programs of service to add and build and increase the facilities of life. Repression is an insignificant part of its work. The use of the club can never be applauded, though it may be tolerated faute de mieux. Its use is a confession of ignorance. A sensitively representative machinery will probably serve such statesmanship best. For the easy expression of public opinion in government is a clue to what services are needed and a test of their success. It keeps the processes of politics well ventilated and reminds politicians of their excuse for existence. In that kind of statesmanship there will be a premium on inventiveness, on the ingenuity to devise and plan. There will be much less use for lawyers and a great deal more for scientists. The work requires industrial organizers, engineers, architects, educators, sanitists, to achieve what leadership brings into the program of politics. This leadership is the distinctive fact about politics. The statesman acts in part as an intermediary between the experts and his constituency. He makes social movements conscious of themselves, expresses their needs, gathers their power, and then thrusts them behind the inventor and the technician in the task of actual achievement. What Roosevelt did in the conservation movement was typical of the statesman's work. He recognized the need of attention to natural resources, made it public, crystallized its force, and delegated the technical accomplishment to Pinchot and his subordinates. But creative statesmanship requires a culture to support it. It can neither be taught by rule nor produced out of a vacuum. A community that clatters along with its rusty habits of thought unquestioned, making no distinction between instruments and idols, with a dull consumption of machine-made romantic fiction, no criticism, an empty pulpit and an unreliable press, 
will find itself faithfully mirrored in public affairs. The one thing that no Democrat may assume is that the people are dear good souls, fully competent for their task. The most valuable leaders never assume that. No one, for example, would accuse Karl Marx of disloyalty to working men. Yet in 1850 he could write at the demagogues among his friends, quote, While we draw the attention of the German workmen to the undeveloped state of the proletariat in Germany, you flatter the national spirit and the guild prejudices of the German artisans in the grossest manner, a method of procedure without doubt the more popular of the two. Just as the Democrats made a sort of fetish of the words, the people, so you make one of the word proletariat. Unquote. Jean Spargo quotes this statement in his Life. Marx, we are told, could use phrases like democratic miasma. He never seems to have made the mistake of confusing democracy with demolatry. Spargo is perfectly clear about this characteristic of Marx. Quote, he admired most of all, perhaps, that fine devotion to truth as he understood it, and disregard of popularity which marked Owen's life. Contempt for popular opinion was one of his most strongly developed characteristics. He was fond, says Leibnacht, of quoting as his motto the defiant line of Dante, with which he afterwards concluded his preface to Das Kapital. Segui il tuo corso e l'asia di legenti. It is to Marx's everlasting credit that he set the intellectual standard of socialism on the most vigorous intellectual basis he could find. He knew better than to be satisfied with loose thinking and fairly good intentions. He knew that the vast change he contemplated needed every ounce of intellectual power that the world possessed. A fine boast it was that socialism was equipped with all the culture of the age. I wonder what he would have thought of an enthusiastic socialist candidate for governor of New York, who could write that, quote, Until men are free, the world has no need of any more literary efforts, of any more paintings, of any more poems. It is better to have said one word for the emancipation of the race, than to have written the greatest novel of the times. The world doesn't need any more literature. Unquote. I will not venture a guess as to what Marx would have said, but I know what we must say. Without a literature, the people is dumb. Without novels and poems, plays and criticism, without books of philosophy, there is neither the intelligence to plan the imagination to conceive, nor the understanding of a common purpose. Without culture you can knock down governments, overturn property relations, you can create excitement, but you cannot create a genuine revolution in the lives of men. The reply of the working men in 1847 to Cabe's proposal that they found Acaria, a new terrestrial paradise, in Texas, if you please, contains this interesting objection, quote, Because although those comrades who tend to emigrate with Cabet may be eager communists, yet they still possess too many of the faults and prejudices of present-day society by reason of their past education to be able to get rid of them at once by joining Icaria, unquote. That simple statement might be taken to heart by all the reformers and socialists who insist that the people are all right, that only institutions are wrong. The politics of Reconstruction require a nation vastly better educated, a nation freed from its slovenly ways of thinking, stimulated by wider interests, and jacked up constantly by the sharpest kind of criticism. It is puerile to say that institutions must be changed from top to bottom, and then assume that their victims are prepared to make the change. No amount of charters, direct primaries, or short ballots make a democracy out of an illiterate people. Those portions of America where there are voting booths but no schools 
cannot possibly be described as democracies. Nor can the person who reads one corrupt newspaper and then goes out to vote make any claim to having registered his will. He may have a will, but he has not used it. For politics whose only ideal is the routine, it is just as well that men shouldn't know what they want or how to express it. Education has always been a considerable nuisance to the conservative intellect. In the southern states, culture among the Negroes is openly deplored, and I do not blame any patriarch for dreading the education of women. It is out of culture that the substance of real revolutions is made. If by some magic force you could grant women the vote and then keep them from schools and colleges, newspapers and lectures, the suffrage would be no more effective than a blue law against kissing your wife on Sunday. It is democratic machinery with an educated citizenship behind it that embodies all the fears of the conservative and the hopes of the radical. Culture is the name for what people are interested in, their thoughts, their models, the books they read and the speeches they hear, their table talk, gossip, controversies, historical sense and scientific training, the values they appreciate, the quality of life they admire. All communities have a culture. It is the climate of their civilization. Without a favorable culture, political schemes are a mere imposition. They will not work without a people to work them. The real preparation for a creative statesmanship lies deeper than parties and legislatures. It is the work of publicists and educators, scientists, preachers, and artists. Through all the agents that make and popularize thought must come a bent of mind interested in invention and freed from the authority of ideas. The democratic culture must, with critical persistence, make man the measure of all things. I have tried again and again to point out the iconoclasm that is constantly necessary to avoid the distraction that comes of idolizing our own methods of thought. Without an unrelaxing effort to center the mind upon human uses, human purposes, and human results, it drops into idolatry and becomes hostile to creation. The democratic experiment is the only one that requires this willful humanistic culture. An absolutism like Russia's is served better when the people accept their ideas as authoritative and piously sacrifice humanity to a non-human purpose. An aristocracy flourishes where the people find a vicarious enjoyment in admiring the successes of the ruling class. That prevents men from developing their own interests and looking for their own successes. No doubt Napoleon was well content with the philosophy of those guardsmen who drank his health before he executed them. But those excellent soldiers would make dismal citizens. A view of life in which man obediently allows himself to be made grist for somebody else's mill is the poorest kind of preparation for the work of self-government. You cannot long deny external authorities in government and hold to them for the rest of life, and it is no accident that the nineteenth century questioned a great deal more than the sovereignty of kings. The revolt went deeper, and democracy in politics was only an aspect of it. The age might be compared to those years of a boy's life when he becomes an atheist and quarrels with his family. The nineteenth century was a bad time not only for kings, but for priests, the classics, parental autocrats, indissoluble marriage, Shakespeare, the Aristotelian politics, and the validity of logic. If disobedience is man's original virtue, as Oscar Wilde suggested, it was an extraordinarily virtuous century. Not a little of the revolt was an exuberant rebellion for its own sake. There were also counter-revolutions, deliberate returns to orthodoxy, as in the case of Chesterton. The transvaluation of values was performed by many hands into all sorts of combinations. 
There have been other periods of revolution. Heresy is just a few hours younger than orthodoxy. Disobedience is certainly not the discovery of the nineteenth century. But the quality of it is. I believe Chesterton has hold of an essential truth when he says that this is the first time men have boasted of their heresy. The older rebels claim to be more orthodox than the church, to have gone back to the true authorities. The radicals of recent times proclaim that there is no orthodoxy, no doctrine that men must accept without question. Without doubt, they deceive themselves mightily. They have their invisible popes, called art, nature, science, with regalia and ritual and a catechism. But they don't mean to have them. They mean to be self-governing in their spiritual lives. And this intention is the half-perceived current which runs through our age and galvanizes so many queer revolts. It would be interesting to trace out the forms it has taken, the abortive cults it has tried and abandoned. In another connection I pointed to autonomy as the hope of syndicalism. It would not be difficult to find a similar assertion in the feminist agitation. From Mrs. Gilman's profound objections against a man-made world to the lady who would like to vote about her taxes, there is a feeling that woman must be something more than a passive creature. Walter Pater might be quoted in his conclusion to the effect that, quote, the theory or idea or system which requires of us the sacrifice of any part of experience, in consideration of some interest into which we cannot enter, or some abstract theory we have not identified with ourselves, or what is only conventional, has no real claim upon us." Unquote. The desire for self-direction has made a thousand philosophies as contradictory as the temperaments of the thinkers. A storehouse of illustration is at hand. Nietzsche advising the creative man to bite off the head of the serpent which is choking him, and become a transfigured being, a light-surrounded being that laughed, one might point to Stirner's absolute individualism, or turn to Whitman's wholehearted acceptance of every man with his catalogue of defects and virtues. Some of these men have cursed each other roundly. Georges Sorel, for example, who urges working men to accept none of the bourgeois morality, and becomes most eloquent when he attacks other revolutionists. I do not wish to suggest too much unanimity in the hundreds of artists and thinkers that are making the thought of our times. There is a kind of professional reconciler of opposites who likes to lump all the prominent rebels together and refer to them affectionately as us radicals. Yet that there is a common impulse in modern thought which strives towards autonomy is true and worth remarking. In some men it is half-conscious, in others a minor influence, but almost no one of weight escapes the contagion of it entirely. It is a new culture that is being prepared. Without it there would today be no demand for a creative statesmanship which turns its back upon the routine and the taboo, kings and idols, and non-human purposes. It does more. It is making the atmosphere in which a humanly centered politics can flourish. The fact that this culture is multiform and often contradictory is a sign that more and more of the interests of life are finding expression. We should rejoice at that, for profusion means fertility. Where a dead uniformity ceases, invention and ingenuity flourish. Perhaps the insistence on the need of a culture in statecraft will seem to many people an old-fashioned delusion. Among the more rigid socialists and reformers it is not customary to spend much time discussing mental habits. That, they think, was made unnecessary by the discovery of an economic basis of civilization. The destinies of society are felt to be too solidly set in industrial conditions to allow any cultural direction. Where there is no choice, of what importance is opinion? 
All propaganda is, of course, a practical tribute to the value of culture. However inevitable the process may seem, all socialists agree that its inevitability should be fully realized. They teach at one time that men act from class interests, but they devote an enormous amount of energy to making men conscious of their class. It evidently matters to that supposedly inevitable progress whether men are aware of it. In short, the most hardened socialist admits choice and deliberation, culture and ideals into his working faith. He may talk as if there were an iron determinism, but his practice is better than his preachment. Yet there are necessities in social life. To all the purposes of politics it is settled, for instance, that the trust will never be unscrambled into small competing businesses. We say in our argument that a return to the days of the stagecoach is impossible, or that you cannot turn back the hands of the clock. Now man might return to the stagecoach if that seemed to him the supreme goal of all his effort just as anyone can follow Chesterton's advice to turn back the hands of the clock if he pleases. But nobody can recover his yesterdays, no matter how much he abuses the clock. And no man can expunge the memory of railroads, though all the stations and engines were dismantled. Quote, From this survival of the past, says Bergson, it follows that consciousness cannot go through the same state twice. Unquote. This is the real necessity that makes any return to the imagined glories of other days an idle dream. Graham Wallace remarks that those who have eaten of the tree of knowledge cannot forget. Quote, Mr. Chesterton cries out like the cyclops in the play against those who complicate the life of man and tells us to eat caviar on impulse, instead of grape-nuts on principle. But since we cannot unlearn our knowledge, Mr. Chesterton is only telling us to eat caviar on principle. Unquote. The binding fact we must face in all our calculations, and so in politics too, is that you cannot recover what is past. That is why educated people are not to be pressed into the customs of their ignorance, why women who have reached out for more than Kirke, Kinder und Kuke can never again be entirely domestic and private in their lives. Once people have questioned an authority, their faith has lost its naivete. Once men have tasted inventions like the trust, they have learned something which cannot be annihilated. I know of one reformer who devotes a good deal of his time to intimate talks with powerful conservatives. He explains them to themselves. Never after do they exercise their power with the same unquestioning ruthlessness. Life is an irreversible process, and for that reason its future can never be a repetition of the past. This insight we owe to Bergson. The application of it to politics is not difficult, because politics is one of the interests of life. We can learn from him in what sense we are bound. Quote, the finished portrait is explained by the features of the model, by the nature of the artist, by colors spread out on the palette. But even with the knowledge of what explains it, no one, not even the artist, could have foreseen exactly what the portrait would be, for to predict it would have been to produce it before it was produced. Unquote. The future is explained by the economic and social institutions which were present at its birth. The trust and the labor union, all the movements and institutions will condition it. Just as the talent of the painter is formed or deformed, in any case is modified, under the very influence of the work he produces, so each of our states, at the moment of its issue, modifies our personality, being indeed the new form we are just assuming. It is then right to say that what we do depends on what we are, 
but it is necessary to add also that we are, to a certain extent, what we do, and that we are creating ourselves continually. What I have called culture enters into political life as a very powerful condition. It is a way of creating ourselves. Make a blind struggle luminous, drag an unconscious impulse into the open day, see that men are aware of their necessities, and the future is in a measure controlled. The culture of today is for the future an historical condition. That is its political importance. The mental habits we are forming, our philosophies and magazines, theaters, debates, schools, pulpits, and newspapers become part of an active past which, as Bergson says, quote, follows us at every instant, all that we have felt, thought, and willed from our earliest infancy is there, leaning over the present which is about to join it, pressing against the portals of consciousness that would fain leave it outside." Unquote. Socialists claim that because the McNamara brothers had no class consciousness, because they were without a philosophy of society and an understanding of the labor movement, their sense of wrong was bound to seek out dynamite. That is a profound truth backed by abundant evidence. If you turn, for example, to Spargo's Life of Karl Marx, you see that all through his career Marx struggled with the mere insurrectionists. It was the men without the Marxian vision of growth and discipline who were forever trying to lead little marauding bands against the governments of Europe. The fact is worth pondering. The Marxian socialists, openly declaring that all authority is a temporary manifestation of social conditions, have waged what we must call a war of culture against the powers of the world. They have tried to arouse in working men the consciousness of an historical mission. The patience of that labor is one of the wonders of the age. But the McNamaras had a culture that could help them not at all. They were Catholics, Democrats, and old-fashioned trade unionists. Religion told them that authority was absolute and eternal. Politics that Jefferson had said about all there was to say. Economics insisted that the struggle between labor and capital was an everlasting seesaw. But life told them that society was brutal. An episode like the shirtwaist factory fire drove them to blasphemy and dynamite. Those bombs at Los Angeles, assassination and terrorism, are compounded of courage, indignation, and ignorance. Civilization has much to fear from the blind class antagonisms it fosters, but the preaching of class consciousness, far from being a fomenter of violence, must be recognized as the civilizing influence of culture upon economic interests. Thoughts and feelings count. We live in a revolutionary period, and nothing is so important as to be aware of it. The measure of our self-consciousness will more or less determine whether we are to be the victims or the masters of change. Without philosophy we stumble along, the old routines and the old taboos are breaking up anyway. Social forces are emerging which seek autonomy and struggle against slavery to non-human purposes. We seem to be moving towards some such statecraft as I have tried to suggest. But without knowledge of it, that progress will be checkered and perhaps futile. The dynamics for a splendid human civilization are all about us. They need to be used. For that, there must be a culture practiced in seeking the inwardness of impulses, competent to ward off the idols of its own thought, hospitable to novelty, and sufficiently inventive to harness power. Why this age should have come to be what it is, why at this particular time the whole drift of thought should be from authority to autonomy would be an interesting speculation. 
It is one of the ultimate questions of politics. It is like asking why Athens in the 5th century B.C. was singled out as the luminous point of the Western world. We do not know enough to cut under such mysteries. We can only begin to guess why there was a renaissance, why in certain centuries man seems extraordinarily creative. Perhaps the modern period, with its flexibility, sense of change, and desire for self-direction, is a liberation due to the great surplus of wealth. Perhaps the ease of travel, the popularizing of knowledge, the breakdown of frontiers, have given us a new interest in human life by showing how temporary are all its instruments. Certainly placid or morose acceptance is undermined. If men remain slaves either to ideas or to other men, it will be because they do not know they are slaves. Their intention is to be free. Their desire is for a full and expressive life, and they do not relish a lopsided and lamed humanity. For the age is rich with varied and generous passions. This is the end of A Preface to Politics by Walter Lippmann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This book was recorded for you by David Martin.